Sections 15 through 29 of Barclay's Treatise. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Lynch. Sections 15 through 29. A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge. Part 1. By George Barclay. 15. In short, let any one consider those arguments which are thought manifestly to prove that colors and taste exist in the mind, and he shall find they may, with equal force, be brought to prove the same thing of extension, figure, and motion. Though it must be confessed, this method of arguing does not so much prove that there is no extension or color in an outward object, as that we do not know by sense which is the true extension or color of the object, but the arguments foregoing plainly show it to be impossible that any color or extension at all, or other sensible quality whatsoever, should exist in an unthinking subject without the mind, or in truth, that there should be any such thing as an outward object. 16. But let us examine a little the received opinion. It is said extension is a mode or accident of matter, and that matter is the substratum that supports it. Now I desire that you would explain to me what is meant by matter supporting extension. Say you, I have no idea of matter, and therefore cannot explain it. I answer, though you have no positive, yet, if you have any meaning at all, you must at least have a relative idea of matter, though you know not what it is, yet you must be supposed to know what relation it bears to accidents, and what is meant by its supporting them. It is evident support cannot here be taken in its usual or literal sense, as when we say that pillars support a building. In what sense, therefore, must it be taken? 17. If we inquire into what the most accurate philosophers declare themselves to mean by material substance, we shall find them acknowledge they have no other meaning annexed to those sounds, but the idea of being in general, together with the relative notion of its supporting accidents. The general idea of being appeareth to me the most abstract and incomprehensible of all other, and as for its supporting accidents, this, as we have just now observed, cannot be understood in the common sense of those words. It must therefore be taken in some other sense, but what that is they do not explain. So that when I consider the two parts or branches which make the signification of the words material substance, I am convinced there is no distinct meaning annexed to them. But why should we trouble ourselves any farther in discussing this material substratum of support, of figure and motion, and other sensible qualities? Does it not suppose they have an existence without the mind? And is not this a direct repugnancy, and altogether inconceivable? 18. But though it were possible that solid, figured, movable substances may exist without the mind, corresponding to the ideas we have of bodies, yet... How is it possible for us to know this? Either we must know it by sense or by reason. As for our senses, by them we have the knowledge only of our sensations, ideas, or those things that are immediately perceived by sense. Call them what you will, but they do not inform us that things exist without the mind, or unperceived, like to those which are perceived. This the materialists themselves acknowledge. It remains, therefore, that if we have any knowledge at all of external things, it must be by reason, inferring their existence from what is immediately perceived by sense. But what reason can induce us to believe the existence of bodies without the mind from what we perceive, since the very patrons of matter themselves do not pretend there is any necessary connection betwixt them and our ideas? I say, it is granted on all hands, and what happens in dreams, frenzies, and the like puts it beyond dispute that it is possible we might be affected with all the ideas we have now though there were no bodies existing without resembling them. Hence, it is evident the supposition of external bodies is not necessary for the producing of our ideas, since it is granted they are produced sometimes, and might possibly be produced always in the same order. We see them in at present without their concurrence. 19. But, though we might possibly have all our sensations without them, Yet perhaps it may be thought easier to conceive and explain the manner of their production by supposing external bodies in their likeness rather than otherwise, 
and so it might be at least probable there are such things as bodies that excite their ideas in our minds. But neither can this be said, for, though we give the materialists their external bodies, they, by their own confession, are never the near knowing how our ideas are produced, since they own themselves unable to comprehend in what manner body can act upon spirit, or how it is possible it should imprint any idea in the mind. Hence it is evident the production of ideas or sensations in our minds can be no reason why we should suppose matter or corporeal substances, since that is acknowledged to remain equally inexplicable with or without this supposition. If, therefore, it were possible for bodies to exist without the mind, yet to hold they do so, must needs be a very precarious opinion, since it is to suppose, without any reason at all, that God has created innumerable beings that are entirely useless and serve to no manner of purpose. 20. In short, if there were external bodies, it is impossible we should ever come to know it, and if there were not, we might have the very same reasons to think there were that we have now. Suppose, what no one can deny possible, an intelligence without the help of external bodies to be affected with the same train of sensations or ideas that you are, imprinted in the same order and with like vividness in his mind. I ask whether that intelligence hath not all the reason to believe the existence of corporeal substances, represented by his ideas and exciting them in his mind that you can possibly have for believing the same thing. Of this, there can be no question. Which one consideration were enough to make any reasonable person suspect the strength of whatever arguments he may think himself to have for the existence of bodies without the mind? 21. Were it necessary to add any farther proof against the existence of matter after what has been said, I could instance several of those errors and difficulties, not to mention impieties, which have sprung from that tenet. It has occasioned numberless controversies and disputes in philosophy, and not a few of far greater moment in religion. But I shall not enter into the detail of them in this place as well, because I think arguments a posteriori are unnecessary for confirming what has been, if I mistake not, sufficiently demonstrated a priori, as because I shall hereafter find occasion to speak somewhat of them. 22. I am afraid I have given cause to think I am needlessly prolix in handling this subject, for to what purpose is it to dilate on that which may be demonstrated with the utmost evidence in a line or two, to any one that is capable of the least reflection? It is but looking into your own thoughts, and so trying whether you can conceive it possible for a sound, or figure, or motion, or color, to exist without the mind, or unperceived. This easy trial may perhaps make you see that what you contend for is a downright contradiction, insomuch that I am content to put the whole upon the issue. If you can but conceive it possible for one extended movable substance, or, in general, for any one idea, or anything like an idea, to exist otherwise than in a mind perceiving it, I shall readily give up the cause, and, as for all that compages of external bodies you contend for, I shall grant you its existence, though you cannot either give me any reason why you believe it exists, or assign any use to it when it is supposed to exist. I say, the bare possibility of your opinions being true shall pass for an argument that it is so. 23. But, say you, Surely there is nothing easier than for me to imagine trees, for instance, in a park, or books existing in a closet, and nobody by to perceive them. I answer, you may so, there is no difficulty in it. But what is all this, I beseech you, more than framing in your mind certain ideas which you call books and trees, and the same time omitting to frame the idea of any one that may perceive them? But do not you yourself perceive or think of them all the while? This, therefore, is nothing to the purpose. It only shows you have the power of imagining or forming ideas in your mind. But it does not show that you can conceive it possible the objects of your thought may exist without the mind. To make out this, it is necessary that you conceive them existing, unconceived or unthought of, which is a manifest repugnancy. When we do our utmost to conceive the existence of external bodies, we are all the while only contemplating our own ideas. 
but the mind taking no notice of itself is deluded to think it can and does conceive bodies existing unthought of or without the mind though at the same time they are apprehended by or exist in itself a little attention will discover to any one the truth and evidence of what is here said and make it unnecessary to insist on any other proofs against the existence of material substance. 24. It is very obvious, upon the least inquiry into our thoughts, to know whether it is possible for us to understand what is meant by the absolute existence of sensible objects in themselves, or without the mind. To me it is evident those words mark out either a direct contradiction, or else nothing at all. And to convince others of this, I know no readier or fairer way than to entreat they would calmly attend to their own thoughts, and if by this attention the emptiness or repugnancy of those expressions does appear, surely nothing more is requisite for the conviction. It is on this, therefore, that I insist to wit that the absolute existence of unthinking things are words without a meaning, or which include a contradiction. This is what I repeat and inculcate and earnestly recommend to the attentive thoughts of the reader. 25. All our ideas, sensations, notions, or the things which we perceive, by whatsoever means they may be distinguished, are visibly inactive. There is nothing of power or agency included in them, so that one idea or object of thought cannot produce or make any alteration in another. To be satisfied of truth of this, there is nothing else requisite but a bare observation of our ideas. For, since they and every part of them exist only in the mind, it follows that there is nothing in them but what is perceived. But whoever shall attend to his ideas, whether of sense or reflection, will not perceive in them any power or activity. There is, therefore, no such thing contained in them. A little attention will discover to us that the very being of an idea implies passiveness and inertness in it, insomuch that it is impossible for an idea to do anything, or, strictly speaking, to be the cause of anything, neither can it be the resemblance or pattern of any active being, as is evident from section 8, whence it plainly follows that extension, figure, and motion cannot be the cause of our sensations, to say, therefore, that these are the effects of powers resulting from the configuration, number, motion and size of corpuscles must certainly be false. 26. We perceive a continual succession of ideas. Some are anew excited, others are changed or totally disappear. There is, therefore, some causes of these ideas, whereupon they depend, and which produces and changes them. That this cause cannot be any quality or idea, or combination of ideas, is clear from the preceding section. I must, therefore, be a substance, but it has been shown that there is no corporeal or material substance. It remains, therefore, that the cause of ideas is an incorporeal active substance or spirit. 27. A spirit is one simple, undivided, active being. As it perceives ideas, it is called the understanding, and as it produces or otherwise operates about them, it is called the will. Hence, there can be no idea formed of a soul or spirit, for all ideas whatever, being passive and inert, we de section 25, that cannot represent unto us, by way of image or likeness, that which acts. A little attention will make it plain to any one that to have an idea, which shall be like that active principle of motion and change of ideas, is absolutely impossible. Such is the nature of spirit, or that which acts, that it cannot be of itself perceived, but only by the effects which it produceth. If any man shall doubt of the truth of what is here delivered, let him but reflect, and try if he can frame the idea of any power or active being, and whether he has ideas of two principal powers, marked by the names will and understanding, distinct from each other as well as from a third idea of substance or being in general with a relative notion of its supporting or being the subject of the aforesaid powers, which is signified by the name, soul, or spirit. This is what some hold, but, so far as I can see, the words will, soul, spirit, do not stand for different ideas, or, in truth, for any idea at all. 
but for something which is very different from ideas, and which, being an agent, cannot be like unto, or represented by, any idea whatsoever. Though it must be owned at the same time that we have some notion of soul, spirit, and the operations of the mind, such as willing, loving, hating, inasmuch as we know or understand the meaning of these words. 28. I find I can excite ideas in my mind at pleasure, and vary and shift the scene as oft as I think fit. It is no more than willing, and straightway this or that idea arises in my fancy, and by the same power it is obliterated and makes way for another. This making and unmaking of ideas doth very properly denominate the mind active. Thus much is certain and grounded on experience, but when we think of unthinking agents or of exciting ideas exclusive of volition, we only amuse ourselves with words. 29. But whatever power I may have over my own thoughts, I find the ideas actually perceived by sense have not a like dependence on my will. When in broad daylight I open my eyes, it is not in my power to choose whether I shall see or know, or to determine when particular objects shall present themselves to my view. And so, likewise as to the hearing and other senses, the ideas imprinted on them are not creatures of my will. There is, therefore, some other will or spirit that produces them. End of sections 15 to 29